Well, mighty fine good morning, everybody. My name is Kale Harbor. I'm the product manager here at Advanced Control Solutions. We are a Cognix ASP. Um, we cover this in the US, the states of Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. Been working with Cognix for a number of years. And for those of you who are familiar with our company, um, wanted to thank you for taking the time to attend our first ever machine vision workshop. So this is a new one for us. We have not done this online yet. Could I get a quick message from somebody in the group in the public chat that my screen's coming through all right and that you're seeing the introductory screen? Uh, would be great. So what we're gonna be covering today is the basics of Cognix's Easy Builder software package for basic machine vision inspection. So we're going to be going through the basic principles of machine vision. We're going to be covering terms, definitions, main components associated with it. We're also going to be doing hands-on labs. Now, normally in our classroom environment, we would have all of our students set up with laptops. We would be going around the room working with you. So in the purpose of today, I'm going to be doing the demonstration of how to solve the various lab exercises what tools we're going to use to do it. We did send the links out to you earlier, or if you have not received them, as I say, please post a message to the public chat forum, and Kelsey can email you those links again today if you did not receive it, and you can follow along as we do it. Now, don't worry if you, we get lost, if someone does drop behind, all of these videos are gonna be posted on our YouTube channel. They're gonna be broken into sections of the individual lab exercises, and you can go back and repeat any one that you need to. So that being said, let's keep going. So this is where we generally like to start, just with a basic definition to get everybody on the same page of what can machine vision do? What is it that you can accomplish using a machine vision camera? Some common applications, and by no means is this all of them. You can use them to guide by guiding your sending coordinates to a robot, to a gantry mechanism, to trimming knives, to a die cutter, to another servo motor, to set of guide rails, whatever is going to need that adjustment from product to product going downstream. We can take advantage of machine vision to be able to locate where that part is and be able to send those coordinates out. One common aspect is inspection. We can, of course, do a great deal with machine vision inspection. We can look for defects, measure, look for find edges, count the number of products within a package, look for defects, broken products, short shots on injection molding, variety of things. We can deal with many aspects of product deformation, quality control, inconsistencies in their manufacturing process to make sure that we can eliminate anything that would not be acceptable out of the value stream so your customer doesn't receive those. Gauging. We do a lot of work doing gauging where we're measuring parts, especially within the automotive sector. A lot of critical components on crankshafts, drive shafts, uh, retaining ring holders, clips, brake pads. Electronics is also very common. Sizes of Components, gaps between sizes, making sure everything's there, put in the, in the correct place and the correct distance from each other. So being able to do that non-contact, fast measurement, to be able to lock on that part, lay down that series of measurement tools. Then of course, to identify. Identifying takes on several forms. One is being able to read barcodes, 1D, 2D, including QR, some of the other terms, interleave two of five, codes three of nine, UPC barcodes, being able to read those and bring into the system. Also being able to perform OCR, OCV. We're gonna get into what those are, but basically we're gonna teach the camera how to read this morning. This is a screen we generally start with during our machine vision workshops. As you're looking at this, the human brain has the amazing ability. When you start looking at this, the first two lines, this message serves to prove how our minds can do amazing things. I'm not gonna read the entire screen. You already get the general gist of it. Our brain is able to fill in missing gaps. It's able to recognize a pattern and make decisions on what it is that should be there. 
in this case, when you have human operators on a line performing quality inspections, the human brain by its nature fills in missing gaps. So a defect that comes down the line and misses a human operator does not mean that you have a bad operator there. It does not mean necessarily you have a bad inspector. But that repetition pattern and the way the human brain works does fill in those gaps. So something might get by and it just not stand out the way that it should because of the way our minds think. So the computer built into these smart cameras, when they see this, they don't read that first word as this. They read that first word as TH15. A computer is rule-based and it is going to interpret these characters according to the rules that it's given. So when we have products coming down the line, we will look at those rules that we have set up or will program into it to be able to make the determination, is this product a good product and allowed to pass, or is this something that I should flag and let somebody know about? So a few examples of how that can work for us. This is a fairly common one. This is a standard water bottle. Um, we all probably have this maybe even on our desk right now. But you can see here, we're doing several things. We're doing a level detection. We're looking at the cap, presence, absence. We're looking at the safety ring. and We're looking to make sure that the label has been applied to the bottle. So as we look at this, very quickly on the left-hand side, we've been able to create a custom HMI screen for use with the operator on the line. So you'll notice that we have turned on a fixture tool. We've turned on a met cap measurement tool, a safety ring tool. There's the fill level and the label tools that have been turned on with the check boxes. And then the results, we can quickly see the cap, the safety ring and the label, all good. They all pass in the green. It's the fill level, it's the problem. So as this is coming by, we get a reject on this and we need to say, okay, why are we getting a reject? By building in this type of HMI screen, the operator, the line worker can quickly say, I need to go check the filler. There's something wrong there. The next setup, something totally different. In this case, cap has been put on. There's a problem. There's either a problem with the cap or with the capper itself. So now we have the feedback that we can go check the capper to make sure of its performance, that it is doing its job correctly. So if you can imagine you're on the production line, you're on the floor, these products are coming by, you get a reject. Well, what's wrong? Why did you get that reject? What's the matter with it? By providing just a little bit of feedback to the operator here, and this could be in the form of IOD or PLC or the HMI that you see here, you can give directions on where you need to check or where the root cause of the problem might be originating at. Here's another example. So within this subassembly, you see we have an entirely different type of inspection, but we've also been able to build an entirely different type of HMI feedback for your operator. So with this feedback, we're able to do some measurement applications and provide the measurements directly to the location where those measurements are being performed. And Kelsey, I see you're still on with us. I just got a private text from someone from um, M. Humphrey that he needs the links to the software if you could re-email that to him. So back to our application here. Uh, by the way, if anyone else needs to get it, please make sure that you're sending the message publicly rather than privately or send it directly to Kelsey and she can get that email to you. Thank you. So. We very quickly see that we have a situation going on. And let me turn on my pointer where we've got this screw. We have a measurement here from our frame of this part until the edge of the screw at 51.6 millimeters. We've got one here, 40.92. Then we've got this measurement, 99.3 and 95.5. And all of these are okay. There's no issues with it. We look at the very next one, you see very clearly we have defective part. We now are able to say there's something wrong with this, but now instead of guessing or trying to look for where the defect is at or where the problem is at, we, very quickly we were able to change the color on our text and be able to show that this one is defective. 
Uh, in addition to not being the right measurement, I don't know how someone was able to put on a flange nut backwards, but someone was very talented in that aspect of it. So now that we've looked at a couple examples of what machine vision can do and how we can communicate back, let's talk about the components that make up a machine vision system. Now, within this, when we do our sit down classes, we have a live audience. I usually like to ask, what is the first component and get people to interact with me on this? We'll get the camera, it's the light, it's the lens, it's a variety of things, but really the most important first aspect is the part itself. How large is the part? What are we looking for? How big is the defect? How small of an item do we need to see? We, in our world, get to see a variety of parts that come through. So we have in our display case down in the lobby of our building right now, a set of surgical sutures. So those surgical sutures that are made for surgeons to be able to use within the operating room have to be manufactured at tolerances where we're dealing with sizes at the round realm of 40 thousandths of an inch. We could immediately go to another customer that needs to inspect a full shipping pallet. And that full shipping pallet might be 48 inches by 48 inches wide. Well, the setup that we need for 40 thousandths of an inch is drastically different from what we need to look at four feet by four feet. So the part, what we're looking at is the first thing we have to know in order to be able to apply the right components and the right tools of the system. The next, next aspect of this is the lighting. What lighting do we need to make this happen? We use lighting very critically for our applications because they're able to either highlight those features that we want to know more about or make features go away that we really don't want to pay attention to. So lighting is very key in being able to give consistency from one part to the next and allow the defects to stand out to be sorted out of the value stream. The next portion of this, the image acquisition. Once we have, know our part, we know the size and all, once we have the lighting, we're able to show the defects. We need to actually acquire the image. This is the computer actually getting the light rays in, hitting an imaging chip, that imaging chip converting it to an electrical signal, which then gets converted into a numerical number. And those numbers that make up the individual elements of that image is what comes in and this acquisition gets us ready to then be able to process that data. The next thing, of course, is the actual processing. Once we have the data array, once we have those numerical values that make up the individual pixels of that image, we need to do something with it. We need to count, we need to look for edges, we need to look for breaks, we need to look for scratches, we need to read text, we need to measure whatever it is that we're doing. We're going to need to put our individual tools on this to be able to perform the inspection that's required. The last aspect. We need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to tell other components of the system, whether it be the PLC, a stack light, a human operator, a solenoid valve on a reject gate. We have to be able to communicate with it to be able to tell it what the results of that inspection is. We're gonna get into each one of these individually. The first thing we're gonna talk, start talking about is the field of view, the actual part itself. So when we talk about the field of view, there's several terms that we have to get some definitions down for. The three big terms that you see here on the screen is the field of view, the lens, and the working distance. Now you can think of this as an algebra formula. These three items work together. So basic definition, field of view, the field of view is the width and the height of the image that you need to generate in order to be able to see your parts. So you're looking at something 50 millimeters tall by 100 millimeters wide. You're dealing something four feet by four feet. You're dealing with something 18 inches by 16 inches. Whatever it is, the field of view is just the width and the height. The working distance is the distance from your camera to the parts, or I should say more specifically, the lens to the parts. So that working distance, how far the camera needs to be away. Am I looking at a very small part 
again, that surgical suture I referenced, that 40 thousandths of an inch, am I going to be six inches away from it or am I going to be 20 inches away from it? The field of view and the distance go together to make up what lens do I need. And the lens is measured in what we refer to as a focal length. The focal length it happens to reference a distance between the optical glass and the lens. I'll show you an example in a moment. But that focal length, if I'm farther away, I need a higher number to zoom into it. If I'm closer, I need a lower number. So how might I use these three numbers available? Let's say I'm doing an automotive environment. I have a manual assembly station and my camera is overhead at an operator assembly station that I'm going to verify all my parts have been installed correctly. That camera is typically mounted 48 inches above the work surface to be above the height of the operator so that they don't hit their head on it as they're working in the station. In this case, if I need to see a small area zoomed in, I'm going to need a higher focal length lens. But if I take that same camera and that same field of view, that same part, and it's in an automated station, that automated station has robots and gantries or bowl feeders and guards, and I may not be able to physically mount that camera except 10 inches away, 12 inches away, something like that, because it would either go outside the cell or it would get in the way of something else. So in that case, I can take the working distance and field of view, calculate a different focal length lens. Another example is this. Let's say you're already using Cognix cameras. They're already in the storeroom. You already have lenses that are in the storeroom. And this happens with our customers quite regularly. And someone comes to you and say, I have a new application we have to be able to solve, we need to get this up and running quickly. And you go, you grab a camera that you've already got, you grab a lens that you already have. You can then calculate how far do you need to mount the camera away for your existing lens and your existing camera to be able to see your field of view correctly. So you can work this just like an algebraic formula to calculate one against the next. So basic definition terms, the field of view is the maximal, maximum viewable area you're able to inspect, your width and your height of what you're going to be looking at. Your working distance, how the distance between the part you're inspecting and your lens, how far away that you are. And then the focal length of the lens is the distance that it, fo it takes to focus from the optical glass of the lens to where the imaging chip is in the back of the camera. So this distance, if I have a 12 millimeter lens, this distance is gonna be 12 millimeters. Really what you need to know in this case though, is that if you're working with a lower focal length lens, you're dealing a wider field of view, a six, an eight, a nine. The higher up you go in focal length, the 35, a 50, a 75, the more zoomed in that you're going to be for the given mounting distance. All right, standard lenses also have another attribute to them. So this attribute happens to be within the aperture itself. So the aperture you can see here is adjusted to be open or it's adjusted to be closed. This iris or aperture, as you turn one of the adjusting rings on the outside of the lens, will open and close this. Well, it has two effects for us. This will either let more light in or less light, so you can control how much light is coming in to get your image correct. But we have another effect. The smaller the aperture will versus the larger aperture will change the performance of the image that you get in what we term the depth of field. So the depth of field. This is how far can you move an object towards the camera or away from it and still be in focus. So you see a large opening on the aperture, we have a shallow depth of field. A small opening has a large depth of field. So you may have seen this family picture where you've got a couple, they're standing there, there's a floral arrangement, the floral arrangement might be in front of them or behind them. And in, I'm sure you've seen photographers, sometimes the floral arrangement will be in focus and the couple behind them will be a little fuzzy. 
sometimes the couple will be in focus and the flower arrangement fuzzy, or they'll both be in focus. So that large opening, shallow depth of field, you're able to focus on one object or the other while the rest blurs out. Small opening, you get both the near and the far in focus because you get that deeper depth of field. So where this can come in handy is if I'm looking at a part that has various heights to the surface, or I'm dealing with a conveyor that has a variety of different height boxes coming down the line, and I want to be able to make sure I can see from the smallest to the tallest, I want a small opening on my aperture and bigger depth of field. If I'm inspecting something though, and I only want to focus on what's on the top surface and ignore anything underneath it, then I can open up my aperture. I can go with a larger opening, shallow the depth of field and only focus on what I want to inspect. And it will help make the rest of the items in the image out of focus so that I don't consider them as part of my inspection. So there is no blanket definition of a a large depth of field is better than a small depth of field. It all depends on the application and what it is that you're looking to inspect. Here's what's actually going on behind the scenes. So what you have here is as you see the light rays that are coming in from a large opening, the period of time that you're between these red lines that make up the focus area are, is shorter because the angle that the light's coming in. With a small opening, the angle is shallower so you're able to stay between the red lines the lens is able to focus in for a longer period of time. So this is what's actually going on behind the scenes. All right. Now that we've covered some of the basics, this is one that I'd like that we use to be able to show an example on how lenses behave. So this is actually referred to as a focusing target. So it, once you download the Cognex Insight software, you install it on your computer. One of the things that we'll install in the documentation list is this focusing target. You're able to print it out if it would be of help to you to put underneath your camera. So as you focus it, the farther you can see down these fingers, the more in focus that you are. Another way that get, this gets used though is by lens manufacturers comparing one lens to the next. So what we have here is we have an array of focusing targets starting from the center of the field of view, going to the outside edge. This is a lens from, we'll call it manufacturer A. This is a lens from manufacturer B. So if I look at this lens, this row, this image, and this one represent the focusing target in the middle of my field of view. The image here, and the image here represent one of these focusing targets on the edge of the field of view. So you can notice several things going on with this. This row of images, these focusing targets are rounder than the ones on the edge. The ones on the edge are more oval shaped. This oval shape is what we refer to as the parallax. Now, what is parallax? As its lens edge distortion. So at the edge of the lens, you on a standard C-mount style lens, you do get edge distortion closer to the outside edge that you go. You'll get a little bit of an ovaling effect. Now this ovaling effect is consistent. And because it's consistent, there are a lot of inspections that we can still do with this even though it's on the edge, namely pattern recognition and counting are good examples of that. The other thing is this ovaling effect is more pronounced on the lower focal lengths. So when we're working with focal lengths, a three, a six, an eight, a nine, this ovaling effect is more pronounced. Once you get up to about a 16 millimeter lens and higher, this ovaling effect is so minimal, it is for all practical purposes, non-existent, unless you're doing a precision measuring setup. Rule of thumb on this is that you want the working distance of the camera three times away or three times the distance of your field of view. So if I have a field of view that is three inches, I would want to mount the camera at least nine inches or more away. 
that will put me into a focal length lens that is going to give me a very, very small ovaling effect to the outside edge. When you start getting closer, then you do need to be concerned about what type of inspection that you're doing. You'll also notice here there's a difference between the actual focus quality. The clarity of the lens is going to be best in the center. As you get to the edge, you will lose more focus. Also, from one manufacturer to the next, you'll get a difference in quality. So a 12 millimeter lens from manufacturer A might have drastically different effects than from manufacturer B. So if you're having issues seeing things on the outside edge, counting things correctly, reading barcodes on the outside edge, anything like that, check your lens, check the focus quality. It might be, camera might be fine, the distance could be able to be worked with, but the success and failure could just be the quality of the lens that you have on there. If you need to get more specifics as far as lens recommendations, we represent multiple companies for lenses. Uh, a couple of the best that we work with are lenses from Moratex and from Fujinon. Both of those have good quality lenses for their price point that we get good consistency out of. So here's an example of an inspection that I needed to do. This happens to be a palette of washing powders. You may recognize the brand name. In this application, there was only one place on the production line that we could put the camera. It was underneath a catwalk and we were 20 inches above a shipping pallet that measured 40 inches by 48 inches. We had to use a 3.6 millimeter lens to be able to see this field of view at 20 inches away. Because we had such a low focal leak and we had such a short distance, we produced a very distorted image. You can see this dramatic fisheye effect in this bow that we had in the image. I promise you the palette of product was not bowed like this. What we are able to do within the Cognex world, and we will be doing an exercise of this later on, is we were able to calibrate the camera to electronically flatten this out. So a calibration grid is something you can put underneath the camera. You tell it what size the grid is. You then perform a calibration structure and it will mathematically alter the image to then be able to flatten it out to be able to work with. The raw data itself is still coming from the distorted image, but this does help greatly in the programming of it to be able to make sense from one product to the next. Now, a couple specialty products I want to make you aware of this morning are some specialty lenses that we can get involved in with applications. One of those is a telecentric lens. We use these quite regularly for precision measurement applications. So a couple of the examples that we have here, this is a steel ball bearing. This is sitting over a backlight. Backlights are very common to use with telecentric lenses. And you can see here we have a nice crisp edge between the black of the ball and the white of the light behind it. This is one with a standard C-mount lens. And you notice we have a gray area around the outside. That's because the backlight, as it's shining into the lens to a standard lens, the light's trying to wrap around the edges. It's coming in at a little bit of an angle when you get to the outside edge. So you don't get as sharp or as clear a definition of where the part stops and the light begins. The reason behind this is a telecentric lens. Instead of the light traveling through at that crisscross angle that we saw earlier, this is, travels through perfectly straight lines through the lens. So because the light comes in parallel lines, and that is done within the optics of the lens itself, we're able to see each area of the field of view as if we're looking straight down on it. So that means we don't get this type of effect. Same thing here, this crankshaft, nice clear edges, where here we get a little bit of graying as it goes to the outside edge. The other thing that we get involved with are things like this. This is a microplate. This is used for medical applications. Each one of these little holes, you would put a sample, maybe a blood sample or some other fluid in the bottom that is gonna go through testing. When you look down on it with a telecentric lens, because the light travels in parallel lines, all of the holes look perfectly round as if we're straight over the top of it. So now I can see to the bottom of every hole in one shot. If I look at the lower image, 
This is where that parallax comes in so that I look nice and round in the middle. But as I go to the edge, I see more and more of the sidewall of this microplate. I can't see into the bottom of it because I'm looking in and seeing the side of it. So when I'm looking at a case of parts, a case of boxes I need to read codes of, a part like this that has multiple holes throughout my field of view and I need to see straight down to the bottom, a telecentric lens really helps with this. The problem with a telecentric lens, if it is a problem, is the cost associated with it. Telecentric lens typically start around twice what a standard C-mount lens does, but it can ramp up very quickly because in order to get this effect, my lens has to be the same size or larger than the part that I'm looking at. So if I'm dealing with a ball bearing that is going to measure 10 millimeters, I can deal with a very small and inexpensive telecentric lens. However, there are some applications that aren't that small. So in this application, we have a field of view 14 inches by 14 inches. So with this larger field of view, the lens has to be bigger than that. By the way, this lens is mounted with this mounting flange. I couldn't get, with where I was at at the trade show for this, the camera to show up. The camera is actually way up here off the screen, hanging in the air. You can see the cables going up to it here. This lens is so large, weighs about 70 pounds, it has to be mounted and the camera hangs off it rather than the other way around. This lens is about an $8,000 lens. If you need it for your application, if it's something that's performance critical where you get nice sharp edges on everything, it's the great tool for you to be able to use. However, do be aware that when you get to these larger sizes, they become rather large, they require a substantial mounting frame to go with it, and there is a cost associated with it. A few of the other specialty lenses that I wanted to point out, and the purpose of pointing out the specialty lenses is not necessarily to you, for you to remember, in this case, what a boroscope is. It's to walk away with the sheer fact that there are companies, that there are people that make specialty products to solve what you might think is the unsolvable. In this particular case, we have a part here that has a variety of machined or formed ridges within this inside of it. We need to make sure that these have all been formed correctly and don't have any burrs or dents in it. We need to make sure that these are bright white circles going around it. Well, a standard lens above the top of this would only see the surface of this part. But a boroscope has a mirrored ball at the bottom. The camera looks down into this mirrored ball and we're able to see 360 degrees around the inside of the part. So now I can look across for dents, burrs, machine chips, anything that might be out of the ordinary for this part to allow a problem to occur, we can now pull out of the value stream. So don't just think that it's just a standard lens, we can get very creative. If you have an application that you just don't see how you can solve, you don't know how you would be able to apply something to look for it, please run that past us. You can reach out to us at any time on our website or at info at acs-ga.com. Send us your parts, send us your application, maybe some pictures of it, and we can help you with some recommendations. And if you think it's not solvable, we've got a very talented staff of Cognex Vision application engineers that have solved things that I didn't think was possible. Um, very creative guys, so please get us involved. All right, let's keep moving. So now we've identified our part. Now we have to be able to light it up. We have to provide lighting to it. And lighting does several things for us. It creates the contrast in the part, provides consistency from image to image, minimizes the ambient light effects. In other words, the skylights, the bay doors, the lights in the building, how it might behave. But it's not an exact science, it does need testing. We do need to put parts underneath the camera and underneath the light to make sure of how it's gonna behave 100%. There's some generalities that exist, but it's always good to double check and make sure we get the right performance. When we're talking about an image coming into our camera, 
our camera has an industrial computer in it. That computer is working off an array of numbers. It performs mathematical functions. So what happens in our case, the light will hit our part. This light comes into the camera and it strikes an imaging chip. And that imaging chip converts it into an electrical signal into a series of numbers. You may have heard the phrase, the programmer's phrase, garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data that comes in, you're gonna make bad decisions from it in your computer program. In the case of machine vision, this image is our data set. This is the raw data that we're going to use to make our decisions. The better the data set, the better the image to the camera, the more consistent decision we're gonna get out of it. And that's what lighting allows us to do. Now, one other thing to keep in mind, we're not creating an image that we're gonna place in an art gallery. We're not looking for something we're gonna frame and hang on the wall. There are times where the camera may make better decisions on an image that's what we would think to the human eye is too dark or too bright or not evenly lit enough. We're looking for an image that produces the best data set. So in some cases, the image we get may not be completely appealing to the eye, but very useful to the computer to be able to make consistent decisions. Several forms that lighting comes in. So we've already talked about backlights. We've already looked at examples with our telecentric lenses where we would have the light behind the part to create a silhouette. Works very good for precision measurings. But there's some other lighting that we're going to get into. Namely, bright field lighting we're going to talk about. Shining the light directly on a part and back up. Diffuse lighting takes the form of either axial, which is a box with a reflective mirror in it the camera looks through, or a dome light to be able to have the camera look through a hole in the top of the dome, versus a dark field light. Dark field light, light's gonna come in from the side, going to hit the part and then reflect up. Now I'm only gonna show a couple of basic examples today. Coming up in May, we're going to be announcing a dedicated lighting workshop where we're just going to spend about an hour going through live examples of the different lights and the different techniques. So if you're interested in that, getting more detail, please stay on the lookout for it or keep up with our YouTube channel. We'll be posting it there once the workshop is over with and we'll be getting into all these techniques in greater detail. So the examples I have this morning, this is an example of a bright field light on this part. So we have a light shining directly down on it. The light's coming directly back up into it. And, but you'll notice that this shiny metal piece in the middle of this LED lamp, not LED, I'm sorry, this lamp is reflecting to the point that we might have trouble seeing the details, being able to see is our spiral of our filament correctly formed because of the glare coming back. Where if we look at the same part with the backlight, we get to see everything in silhouette and we can clearly see the gaps between the rings. Likewise, packaging container. This was a metal lid, high gloss finish associated with it, looks very good for the consumer. But again, a bright field ring light coming right down on it, shining right back up. We got the glare coming in from this reflective, shiny polished surface to the point that we not only couldn't see the words, but we could even see the formed button in the middle of this packaging container. This is actually a three-dimensional item that sticks up or down so that you can tell whether or not the vacuum seal of the package has been compromised. Adding a diffuse light to it, a light that's a little softer, probably in the office or the room that you're in now, the lampshade, the diffuser over your fluorescence, the plastic panel, the light is shining through to kind of soften it. That's what we're talking about. A light that will produce that same, what you may have heard of referenced as cloudy day effect such as when you go outside on a cloudy day and the light is just softer and more even throughout because it's filtered through the clouds, helps to get rid of, in this case, not only the glare that we had on the package, but also help to make that three-dimensional aspect go away so that we could read the barcodes, the letters, and the packaging easier. Here's what some of those lights would look like. So we have a diffused light source here that uses a diffuser plate. 
This is that on axis light that we would look through our dome lights, our ring, bright field ring light that goes straight down. The camera would then look through it. Spotlights or bar lights to mount to the side. Again, these can be used as a bright field or a dark field. Dark field light here, the light comes in a very shallow angle to be able to hit the part and reflect off the surface. You can do the same effects of either a bright field or a dark field with individual lights mounted by themselves or a backlight that I would put a part off of and be able to see the silhouette. Again, we're going to pay attention to our YouTube channel or our upcoming workshop series for our lighting workshop that'll be coming up. Now, one other way that we can use light to help make our images more consistent is by adding what is known as a bandpass filter. Now, a bandpass filter helps us to deal with image consistency from one part to the next. Also be able to deal with ambient lighting effects from skylights, bay doors opening up. Or I even had one customer that one day the gentleman had a black shirt on that was the operator, the next day was a white. And the difference of the light reflecting off his shirt made a difference in the way the vision system performed. A bandpass filter helps us with this. So with the bandpass filter and a monochrome camera, we get a lot of advantages. The bandpass filter doesn't work on a color camera because we need to see the full color spectrum. But when I add this to a monochrome and I only let certain wavelengths through, in this case, you can see this curve right here allows wavelengths through at around 800. Well, what is 800? 800 nanometers. Light travels in wavelengths. So the wavelengths that measure 800 nanometers in distance at around 800 are infrared. Visible red light that you would see from a red light bulb is around 620 or 630. 470 is going to be blue. 525 is going to be green. So from the low 400s to the high 600s, this is your visible light spectrum. IR, infrared, is actually invisible to the human eye but the camera is still sensitive to it. So you'll see here only those wavelengths come through and everything else is blocked out. Here's how we're able to do, use this with a monochrome that we can't do with a color camera. This is a huge advantage to us. So you'll see here, I've got a collection of parts that are different colors. I have two that are green, I have two that are red, and two that are blue. So I've, if I look at it with just ambient light with no specific color light and also with no filter, it's real hard to tell the difference between the colors. In fact, the blue to the red looks more different than what the green to the red does. This is going to be much harder to tell the difference with. So in order to solve this, what we do is we would use a monochrome camera and a colored light source. In this case, this example uses a red light and we install a red bandpass filter so that only those red wavelengths come through. Wavelengths that are more opposite each other on a color wheel are going to turn darker. Colors that are the same will turn lighter. So in this case, if I look at the position of these red parts and I put a red light on it, they become white. Blue, which is more opposite to the red on the color wheel, becomes darker. Green also is more opposite on the color wheel and turns darker. If I come over here with a green light source, a green bandpass filter, my green parts now become lighter and my red and my blue parts become darker. But you'll notice the blue is still a different color from the red. And when I say blue and red, I'm talking about the color of the parts. So under a green light, my blue parts become a gray, my red parts become a black, and my green parts become lighter in color. I can now separate these three fairly distinctly using a green light. If I use a blue light source, my red parts now become black because my blue and my red are more opposite. My green parts are darker because the colors don't match exactly but it's still lighter than what my blue parts are. My blue light on my blue parts is going to turn lighter. So 
a monochrome camera, the color of my light will make like colors, similar colors, turn lighter. Opposing colors are going to turn darker. So we can use a monochrome camera, a colored light source, and a bandpass filter to make the parts or features stand out that we want to see, make the parts features go away that we don't want to see, and provide consistency because we're not allowing a lot of other different light sources to come through other than those frequencies that we want. Another type of filter that gets commonly used is this one. It's called a polarizing filter. Now, a polarizing filter is used, can be used in conjunction with a bandpass filter. So let's say I have a red light source or a blue light source. I'm looking at a part. I have a colored bandpass filter, so a red light would have a red bandpass, but I'm still getting glare from my part. It's still glaring and I want to get rid of it. That's where I can add the polarizer. A polarizing filter is made up of a polarizing film that would get mounted to your light. So you can see here's a polarizing film that would go on a ring light versus a bar light versus a backlight. If I put this polarizing film on it, then my light waves are going to come out oriented in just one direction. If I then put a polarizing filter on the front of my lens, it is going to be able to orient the light where everything's coming in in nice straight orientations. If without it, what I wind up with is this glare, this random effect, this light waves coming off in all different directions winds up creating this glare. By using the polarizers and straightening out the light waves, I'm able to cut down on the glare. You notice it doesn't completely get rid of it, but it does reduce it a great deal. So the use of a polarizer on highly reflective objects or objects that are creating glare can be very useful to make your images more consistent. All right, we have identified our field of view. We have our lighting. Now we have to actually acquire our image. This is where we're going to talk about the imaging chip. You've heard me reference the imaging chip several times so far. We've already made reference to it at several points. Here's what it actually is. The imaging chip, which is most common these days, a CMOS style chip, has a sensitive place in the middle that's able to have the ability to receive light waves that come in and excite it and then be able to convert it into an electrical signal. And that electrical signal correlates to the color of light or the intensity of the light that's coming in and striking it. So this imaging chip is made up of a series of rows and columns of pixels in order to generate our image. So in the example of this automotive wheel hub that we have going on, if we take a close in section at this transitional edge, you'll see that we have a series of pixels, little squares that are, that are part of that imaging chip that's actually doing the conversion for us of that light to energy. Now, when it gets converted to energy, this is a computer chip. And computer chips work in a binary world and standard imaging chips run an 8-bit grayscale. What does 8-bit mean? 8-bit, single computer number is either a zero or one, it's binary. If I have eight of them, then I get two, because I can have two conditions, to the eighth power. Two to the eighth power is 256. Since we start at zero, then we our scale runs from zero, being pure black, to 255, being pure white. And I get a total of 256 divisions on the grayscale as I move down this line. So as I look at this image, the pixel that I have here more in the black area gives me a gray value of a zero. The pixel located here during the transition has a gray scale associated with it of 87. And then my pixel out here right over the middle of my backlight is scoring at 255, pure white, which is what we would expect. So. In addition to grayscale, though, the imaging chip also works in resolution. What is our total number of rows and columns that we have? 
So as I look at this camping lantern, you'll notice my lower resolution has larger pixels and a fewer number of rows and columns. The higher I go in resolution by 1600 by 1200 in this case, the more rows and columns I'm gonna have. Well, there's a trade-off with this. The more rows and columns, the smaller the feature I can see, the finer I can measure to, the more resolution I have in the image. The downside of that is, the more pixels I have, the more data I have. The more data I have, the longer it's going to take the computer chip in the camera to process this image and make a decision. Now, there is a, amongst programmers, a law that exists. It's not a natural physical law, but it's referred to as Moore's Law. A gentleman by the name of Moore in the 70s made the statement that computer chips are going to become twice as powerful than what they are and run twice as fast every two years. Well, he was a little off. Since the 70s, although this isn't a formal law, he was very accurate in his presumption that computer chips now double in speed and double in processing power about every 18 months. So every 18 months, we have a new family of computer chips that are coming out and available to us to be able to process this data. So the cameras we have today versus the cameras we have from three years ago, four years ago, are immensely faster. So this rule does apply. The higher the resolution, the more data points, the more times it takes to process. But because our chips have gotten faster within the cameras, that impact is not as big as it used to be. So if I'm running a very high speed line, the highest speed line that I happen to work on for physical part inspection was running 3,300 parts per minute. We have a total of 12 milliseconds to inspect a pattern tool. We had to look at a very small area. I went back and reran that test. I was able to look at the entire field of view within 12 milliseconds, but it still pushed the limits on what my pattern tool could be able to accomplish within that time frame. We so we can deal with higher speeds at higher resolutions today than we could a few years ago, but there's still a limit to it. So if you're dealing in a high speed environment and we need to look for small details, small letters, small defects, definitely we need to test that before we commit to going live with it to make sure that the combination of the resolution, how small of an area we need to see, matches what the camera can deliver in speed to keep up with a high speed line. If you're not running a high speed line, then the higher the resolution, the smaller the part you can see, the smaller the defect, the smaller the feature, the smaller the measurement. So there is a trade-off that you need to be aware of. Here's one example of what a increased resolution can do for us. So this is looking at the same letter G that's part of this label. And we're looking at it at a 0.3 megapixel, standard VGA 640 by 480. And you can see the G, we really don't get a good clear separation between the tail of the G and the body of it. Whereas if we go up to a two megapixel camera, we can see a clear separation between the tail of the G and the body of that G. So there's not a lot of pixels difference between this eight and the G. If my printer becomes a dirty print head, something inconsistent, something's out of alignment, it wouldn't take many pixels for this to be read as the wrong letter. Whereas the higher resolution gives me more pixels and gives us more of a difference between these two. So it would help with stability of parts from one to the next. Now, another type of imaging chip that I want you to be aware of is what's referred to as a line scan. Now, again, usually in our face-to-face -face workshops, I'll ask how many people have ever worked with a line scan. Typically, nobody raises their hand. At most, maybe one person. I'm actually going to challenge each of you today that every one of you has used a line scan system. If you've ever walked up to a copy machine, put a piece of paper on it and hit copy, you've used a line scan system. So the way that works is you have an imaging bar that moves down your piece of paper, takes the image one line at a time, and puts it together to make a copy. Similar process here. The imager within the line scan is 1,000, 2,000, 4,000 pixel columns 
but only one row. So that in order to get an image in, you typically have to tie this type of imaging chip to an encoder. Maybe it's running on a conveyor, coming from a servo motor, so that you can perform some really interesting inspections with it. So a couple examples of that, and I'm gonna let this video run several times to make sure it buffers for everybody correctly. You see here, the first example, we have a car door. Very large door, we need to see very small details. If we mounted our camera far enough away to see the entire door, we couldn't see a small enough feature. By moving the camera closer and building the image one slice at a time, we're able to see smaller details, yet still be able to scan the entire large part. The other example we have in this one, a round part. We wanna make sure that label has been applied correctly, or we have a round part that has markings on it. We wanna make sure the markings have been put on correctly. Now we can take that part and spin it in front of the camera, and by taking one slice at a time, we're able to make a rectangular flat image we can now perform an inspection on after it's been applied. The third example that we have in this video that's cycling is we've got two conveyors with a small gap. The part is coming by. We need to see the bottom. There's no way we can see the entire bottom of the box because we have to be able to hold the box up. But by looking at the gap and putting the image together one slice at a time, we're able to see the entire box as it passes overhead because we're building it up one slice at a time in that gap as it's passing over us. So in this case, we're able to deploy that vision system rather than modifying the existing conveyors or changing the setup. Another type of imaging chip we will do an example of is 3D. So our 3D imagers are a line scan based product. So in this case, we generate a laser line that goes down on the part. So you see the laser generator over here is putting our line down. We have a camera that's looking at it and it then creates a three dimensional profile of what the part looks like for us to be able to do measurements with it. We can also, in the more sophisticated Cognex environment in their Cognex designer programming, we're not going to be getting into that today though, can stitch those together and make an entire three dimensional image of the part so now we can look for divots, voids, dents, anything else within the height surface change of the part itself. All right, so the next thing, we have our image, we've been able to create it, now we need to do something with it. We're not gonna spend a lot of time in that right now. This is gonna be the rest of the workshop that we're going to get into. So we're going to need to put some sort of vision tools on here. So the first examples we're gonna get into, we're gonna be working with blob tools. A blob is a group of pixels that are the same color that are connected to each other so that we can now separate these burned pieces of breakfast cereal from the shadows of the holes and the voids of the good one by using this blob tool to be able to pull them out because nobody can predict what a burnt piece of breakfast cereal actually looks like. Other tools that we are going to get into are going to be measurement tools, edge tools, but also processing filters on how we can electronically process an image to be able to pull details of it or be able to see things better. We're gonna be working with edges to be able to find the edges of parts, to be able to tell us the part is there, be able to measure the distance, or to be able to count how many parts I have within a pack or an area. Pattern tools. This is that pattern tool that I showed you the example earlier from the image. To be able to make sure in this case, our product is turned the correct way, this one's upside down, versus these that were not palletized correctly and we need to reject or notify somebody about it. So we're gonna be working with pattern tools. One of the most powerful pattern tools we have available is referred to as PatMax. PatMax allows us to be able to do detailed pattern analysis including the ability to see that pattern if focus gets out of adjustment, as the part rotates, the polarity of the background changes, the scale changes that parts grow and diminish as they get closer to or farther away from you due to either a bump setup or natural variation of your manufacturing environment. 
So we're going to be doing a live Pat Max example. So the last thing is communications. It does no one any good to have all of this work go into choosing our right lens, our right field of view, our right working distance, our correct camera, the lighting setup, getting everything dialed in, applying the right filters, doing the programming, getting all the work done, unless we can communicate it to the outside world. That communication takes the form of discrete 24 volt DC inputs and outputs. But we also have over 80 native protocols available to us within the cameras. DeviceNet, ProfiNet, Ethernet IP, CC Link, Modbus, OPC, TCP IP, FTP, Telnet, as well as native robot languages for ABB and Yaskawa and Motoman and for all your big guys out there for both either serial or Ethernet based communications. We're going to be doing an example on how to set up that native mode communication using a field bus protocol during the hands-on portion of the workshops. So quick review. We are going to look at a setup where we have a product coming down the line. It's going to arrive at an inspection station. And we're going to have, in this case, a photo eye say there's a part here. And it sends a discrete 24 volt trigger signal to our camera to take our image. We're going to trigger a light to be able to illuminate it, acquire that image in, digitize it, turn it into our numerical array, place it within our vision software with the rules-based tools that we have to be able to determine a good or a bad part. Send an output, communicate to the outside world to, in this case, divert the part to make sure it doesn't continue in the value stream. And then it's highly recommended to include some sort of operator display so that you can notify the operator, the environment, the light tower, whatever it is, how the system is performing and where your good and bad part is. So that being said, that's right. we're right at an hour. This covers the introduction portion of our workshop so far. So I want to open it up. Do we have any questions at this point? Um, if somebody has a question, if they want to post it publicly to the uh, chat room, I'm looking at it right now, just to see if we have anything that comes in that needs to get addressed. I don't see anything coming in. So want to thank you for sitting through this portion of it.